I'm, I'm here as a promoter of media quality, but uh, I've had a very long life, as you can see, and I've been many things. I've been a journalist, I've been an actor, I have been a sociologist, I have been a Chrysler executive, and I've been a theater director, and I was the CEO of a television channel. And when I left television 12 years ago, I reflected on the many harsh decisions I had to make alone, and why it was a little sad that there was no international standards on which one could rely. I still remember one of the things that always the most difficult is what can you show on the news? You're getting so horrible pictures, lurid, bloody, you know, something to vomit. Huh? And what do you show to your viewers at night? What is, what is it good to? So we did, we did an international panel of news editors. We said, uh, we should try to have rules. What, what, what should we do? What should we not do? And we were showing all these terrible pictures. And there was one guy, I still remember, from Mexico. Whatever we were shown to him, we was shown to him, however horrible, he would always say the same thing. Just look at it and say, yeah, but it raises the eyeballs. So we understood that we would have no rules with such cynicism, such media cynicism. At least it was frank, but media cynicism is there. But I still wanted to work on standards. And when the United Nations opened in December 2003, the World Summit on the Information Society right here in Geneva, I took part in that. As you can see, it's still on, but it still has the same convoluted way of speaking about information and the media. I'm just quoting here. Conflicting imperatives of freedom of expression, respect of, of privacy, and challenge on applicable jurisdiction posed by the transborder nature of cyberspace. You can get from this kind of language, we get no information there. <laughs> and during the WISIS, I originated something called the World Electronic Media Forum, that is more for professionals. They're also still on, and they're also still making declarations. I quote again, the part played by journalists is to make society a better place. They must strive to contribute to this goal as best as they can. Sounds like wishful thinking to me. And truth is, citizens of the information society are mostly uninformed. Four reasons to that. Trust in mainstream media is dwindling. Information on new media sources prove unreliable. Money is flowing out of mainstream media to new media, but not on information sites. And governments, many governments, are still against free information. So we founded, I originated, in fact, a media professionals initiative, an international media professionals initiative called the uh, Media and Society Foundation. And our idea was to have precisely a quality management standard for the media. And we were hoping to restore public confidence in the media, helping media face new competition through three things. One is transparency and accountability to all stakeholders. The second thing is self-improvement process through quality control. And the third is simply process, generally is process management. Unfortunately, I must say after 10 years of this experiment, the media industry as a whole did not accept the main principles of this standard, which was accountability and transparency. And the reason of that, I think, is most media leaders I met are more concerned by their financial woes 
or by te technological challenges than by the relevance of their content to the needs of society. True, there are individual media organizations that did take up our standard and successfully, and they're still applying it now, I'll give you three examples, uh, uh, Quality Daily Newspaper of Switzerland, Le Temps, a very successful commercial television of Indonesia, Trans TV, and Onse from Mexico, public service broadcaster, and, and several others. But the general media picture remains bleak. If I take the most important uh, private media empire in the world, Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation, they just have been called, as you know, red-handed in the most horrible criminal activities, as it, stealing a girl's, uh, uh, a dead girl's mobile phone to, 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 to make believe her family that she was still alive to get emotional reactions and thus feed in the public's insatiable appetite for sensation rather than information. And the same thing can be said of News Corp's Fox News, which is the most successful news channel in America, but is not in the business of informing people, but of serving a political agenda and reinforcing viewers' prejudices. So can I get more optimistic by turning to the uh, bacon of public media in the world, the BBC? Alice No, the BBC also has been taken in several scandals. It, was, it has unethical behavior and it placed audience ratings and building image more important than public interest. During the scandals, it lost one chairman, two CEOs, uh, just a new CEO started at the helm of the BBC uh, this month. And what did he say? He said, I promise to win back trust, the most precious commodity for our organization. Too bad they made such cheap use of it. So I gave you these three examples from America and England because the Anglo-Saxon world is, of course, the benchmark of free uh, media. But I could have gone through all of the 200 countries in the world, and in most of them, I would have painted uh, an even more disquieting picture. Wherever I've been, on five continents, I heard the same remark. State media serve the state interests, private media serve the interests of their owners, but who, where are the media serving the public interest? And in most places, the answer is nowhere. So, why is that? Uh, the Pew Research on the State of News Media in America 2013 is painting an even sadder picture for the future because they say the press is now undermanned and it is not in a position to uncover news stories, to dig deep into emerging ones, or even to question information that is transmitted to them. Why is that? Well, because there are now 30% less professional journalists in America, and there are less in, in other countries. I don't give you figures for each country. And the result is 30% of American media users are now deserting their familiar media outlet because they don't find the information that they need. And, of course, the reason is because of revenues are diminishing and are going out uh, of the um, main media. The result is, real information is becoming accessible to fewer and fewer people. Paywalls are now coming on information sites on the internet everywhere, and soon information will only come to those who can afford it. So, once in Mexico, a woman from the Chiapas told me 
this. We Indians need information as much as we need food, water, health care. And she was meaning information in the following sense. Getting the relevant facts to evaluate political decisions and making sure decision makers themselves do access the relevant facts. She was really hitting the central point. Because we are now in a situation, as described by economist Paul Krugman, where we base our judgments on prejudices. We have opinions, no facts. We are becoming, as the French professor Denis Dupré said, idiots, idiots in the classical sense of the Greek, the old Greek. Those who do not have, who are unable to access the political process. And yet, I remain optimistic. Why is that? Well, there are two buzzwords, you must remember. User-generated concept and data journalism. User-generated concept, which is a new way of collaboration between citizens and professional journalists, is the capacity both to reflect social change and to create social change, as was seen in the Arab streets and other places. Rules of journalism used to prevent the broadcast or publication of any news that was not produced by professional journalists. This has been entirely reversed, for the worse, but also for the better. For the worse, because more and more private information is coming as a private, private, representing private interest is coming in as if it were bona fide independent information. But for the better, when you find a situation such as we saw when Al Jazeera television collaborated with local social media to produce change by the people. And there, of course, on the long term, this cooperation between citizens and mainstream media is difficult to establish. But we have now more and more and more examples. I could give you examples until the end of the day, just two of them. In the Philippines, uh, private media and the people collaborated in cleaning the electoral process, in preventing corruption and cheating to a, a very successfully. In England, there was one private firm. This was a commercial fraud ID. And they got a, ju a ju judicial decision preventing the Guardian of printing the incriminating documents. And one tweet by chief editor Alan Rusbridger produced 150,000 tweets from all over Britain so that the firm that had tried to prevent publication of the documents let them go because they were afraid of the public outcry. So we really now are in a situation where collaboration between journalists and the general public can really be a new force. Data journalism. Data journalism is a new feature that can provide citizens with the facts that make their world understandable and manageable. I will give you now a little free publicity to my colleagues and friends from The Guardian in England. Uh, they are the vanguard of data journalism. And they are also good guys trying to serve the public interests. When I was training to be a journalist, reporting was about one thing, it was about words, conjuring up visual images um, with letters of the alphabet, essentially. Now, journalism is about something much more than that. It's about telling that story using the power of data. Data journalism is the use of key information sets, key data, key reference elements to inform a story. It's not the existence of the data. It's not just obtaining it and putting it out there. It's the processing that goes into it to work out what it tells you. And you have to ask the right questions to get the right answers. You're not confined to just using text because you're a newspaper or just using a picture. You can 
do an interactive map when that's right. You can do a really helpful, clear picture when that's the way forward. It lets you tell a story in the way that people watching it, receiving it, will understand it and enjoy it. Nobody trusts journalists anymore. We're the least trusted um, occupation you can imagine. But if you can provide your workings behind the story, you can be open and transparent about that. It makes those stories so much stronger. So you see, data journalism is the journalism of tomorrow. It's a journalism being transparent about its methods and about, and about the clear and absolute separation between facts and opinions. C.P. Scott, The Guardian's founder, famously said, comment is free, but facts are sacred. Opinions we have, our own, and a million others with an easy access. Facts are difficult. Difficult to get, difficult to communicate. But once again, data journalism and the user-generated content, the new collaboration between citizens and journalists can make facts accessible to the general public. We have the tools to build an information society where citizens are really informed. We just have to believe in it and put pressure on media organizations, on private foundations and such, until access to facts become a real uh, priority. The market will not provide it, but we have the model of public media that are financed by the citizens without government interference. The question is, let's make a good use of it. Thank you.